built in 1858, making it about 165 years old. The Bell family moved here from Edinburgh, Scotland in 1870, and they owned this house until 1881. Now, when Alexander moved here with his parents and his sister-in-law, he was very sick with tuberculosis, uh, but recovered within just a few months thanks to Canada's cleaner air quality. Now, we didn't have as many factories at the time burning coal, so the air was a lot better quality. Uh, this is a photo of Alexander at about the time when he moved into this house. And he didn't live here full time. Uh, he actually traveled between Brantford and Boston in the United States because that's where he was teaching as an elocutionist for people with hearing loss. Uh, now an elocutionist today would be called a speech therapist. Uh, so he would help people overcome, or uh, his father was also an elocutionist. Uh, but Alexander taught people how to speak and lip read despite not hearing the sound of their own voice. He did also have two brothers. Uh, their photos are on this same wall here. So the oldest, Melville James, or Melly, is in this frame. Uh, he actually passed away of tuberculosis at only the age of 25. But before he passed away, he was married to this woman. Her name is Carrie or Caroline. And she also had a child with Melly, who passed away a few months before he did. Now, after her child and husband passed, she moved into this house and stayed for five years before she married a man named George Bellacci. Uh, but after she left, Alexander's mother was very sad because it was as if she lost a daughter. Uh, but Carrie stayed quite close with them and even named one of her sons Alec after Alexander. Now, this is their younger brother, Edward Charles, or Ted. Now, he also had tuberculosis and passed away in 1867 at the age of 18. He was never married, but he was very creative and liked drawing caricatures of people. So he took more after their mother, Eliza, who was an artist. Uh, she actually earned money by selling her paintings to support herself, her mother, and her siblings before she got married. Uh, one of her original paintings is actually on the wall to my right there. She actually got married quite late uh, to get married in that time, but her husband was also 10 years younger than her. Uh, Melville her. was 25. Her. <laughs> she, <laughs> right on. Uh, there are photos of Alexander's parents just by the doorway. A library, sitting room, and office for Alexander's father. This is where he would teach those students how to overcome a speech impediment by using an alphabet that he invented with his father. They called that system visible speech, and this is only a small portion of the symbols they created. They each represent a different position to move your mouth, uh, specifically by moving your tongue, lips, throat, and nose. Uh, the way that you position those parts of your mouth can impact your speech, and each part of the symbol actually represents those different parts of anatomy. For example, these small C shapes here are your lips. The way that the symbol is turned is either the back, top, or tip of your tongue, and the thick black line here and here is your throat. Now, Alexander used this with his students to teach them how to speak and lip read. But this part of the house was also used by his mother, Eliza, for her drawing or painting. She liked the natural light that came through the big windows, and she would have had a very nice view of the Grand River, because this house used to be a lot closer to the water. We had it moved to this location in the 1930s because of land erosion, and we didn't want the house to fall apart. Now, we actually have a copy of one of her landscape paintings on the bookshelf here. Uh, it is just a copy, so you can pick it up if you'd like and take a closer look. Uh, but she would have painted that while she lived here in the house. Pass along. Now we actually have that print as postcards in the visitor center if you'd like to pick one up. Uh, but Eliza included a lot of very small details in her art. So if you look closely at the furthest part of the background, you will see some small chimneys above the tree line. 
or just here? Yeah, you can't Little see that. No, I can't see it. I need my Teeny glasses. tiny buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Eliza was also a very talented portrait artist, and one of her self-portraits is just behind you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. She drew that at only 15 years old. Oh. And she also drew a portrait of sketchbooks on that same table as well, just in the corner, right here. And the table that these books are resting on was originally the Bell family's piano. But when they sold their house in 1881, they auctioned off a lot of larger pieces of furniture. Someone purchased that piece, took out all of the musical parts, and turned it into the table. And so about 80% of the items that you'll see around the house did belong to Alexander and his family including some of Melville's favorite books in this case. Uh, he liked reading Robert Burns and Charles Dickens. And the most interesting item in the whole house is on the table in front of me. Now that is Melly, an Australian duck-billed platypus. A lot of the Bell family's relatives were living in Australia at the time, and that was actually a gift to them from their uncle. It is real, and Melly has been here for more than 100 years. We came like that. <laughs> There's a date and time you could bring animals into the country now you couldn't bring them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, was it a big deal to move the house? Well, it would have taken a lot of time, effort, and money. Um, but I'm not sure how they did it. Um, it was in the 1930s that they moved the house, so I honestly have no idea. But it would take some big machinery. Especially then. Yeah. yeah. Well, this room here is where the Bell family ate all four meals of the day. In the morning, they would have breakfast. At noon, they would have dinner. At about four o'clock, they would have afternoon tea. And close to seven or eight p.m., they would have their supper. Uh, this room, when the Bell family moved in, was actually the original kitchen. And the library was the dining room. But Eliza wanted a larger kitchen and more space. So they rearranged the layout of this house and had this turned into their dining room. Now, more of their artifacts are actually uh, presented here on the sideboard, including the silver tea set, which was given to Alexander and his wife when they got married on July 11th, 1877. Uh, Alexander's wife, Mabel, was American. Her family was from Boston, and they were quite wealthy because her father was a lawyer meaning she could do quite a bit of traveling. Uh, when Mabel had married Alexander, she traveled to Paris, France, and purchased an entire set of dishes just for her husband. That set included this soup tureen, and it would have been very difficult to find because there's no pattern on it. Pattern dishes were a lot more common and more widely produced, but Alexander was afraid of them. When he was younger, his family's plate set had butterflies painted on them, and as he was eating, he thought the butterflies were staring at him. <laughs> so he preferred plain white dishes. Uh, but Mabel also had her husband's initials monogrammed onto all of the pieces. And that's this design here. Uh, the letters AGB stacked on top of one another. Oh. So Alexander was definitely different. He had some quirks. But he was incredibly intelligent and very passionate about music. Actually, as a young boy, his mother taught him how to play the piano, and then he learned how to play the melodeon. Now, the melodeon is a smaller pump organ. Uh, to play it, you have to pump the pedals at the bottom, which feeds air into the airbags. Unfortunately, those airbags are damaged, but what makes this piece special is this was the first ever instrument to play across a telephone call. Oh. And Alexander was the person playing it. And he's the man for whole music. <laughs> Check your leftovers. They probably wouldn't be very good anymore, but you can come back in December. <laughs> All right. Now, as I mentioned, the original kitchen was where the dining room is, and this kitchen was actually built on after the family moved in. Now, since it's larger, you can do more chores or tasks in this space, including cooking every day. Now, unfortunately, this stove is not the original, but it was built right here in Brantford in the 1870s, 
So it's still about 150 years old, and it would burn either coal or wood as a fuel source. So the fire would be started in this compartment, and the Bell family would have been burning wood because they maintained a 10-acre farm. Uh, so they would have gone outside and chopped down a tree instead of purchasing coal. Once the fire was burning nice and hot, they could use the stove top to cook or heat up their iron every Tuesday. Every Wednesday, the Bell family would bake in the oven here. And the oven door has a small window on it. That way you can make sure nothing burns. Now, one of the, one of the flaws I'll say about this kitchen is the lack of running water, which means there's no sink. There's no toilet in the house either, but they got fresh water from the well outside and would keep some in the reservoir to easily make tea, cook, or heat up their bath every Friday. Uh, the Bell family did bathe in the kitchen because the stove made this room nice and warm. <coughs> and they would bathe from the oldest member of the family to the youngest, and they would all share the same water. Oh, so Alexander, being the youngest in the house, had a cold and dirty bath. But <laughs> but uh, about a year or two after the family moved in, Alexander did install a shower and bathtub for the family. Some heat from the fire on the stove would also rise through this pipe into the warming closet, which keeps your food warm and is helpful if you're cooking a larger meal. But they would also use it for their chicken and duck eggs in the winter to make sure they hatch properly. They used it as an incubator. Oh, that's good. <laughs> now you'll also notice that this kitchen doesn't have a lot of storage, aside from the shelf and cabinet behind me. But if you look to your right, you will see a pantry with built-in shelving on the wall for most of their dishes, as well as two extra cabinets. And if you look on the floor, You'll see the trap door to the So, a very modern piece of technology in the pantry. That's that big washing machine for the laundry. You would have to open the top, put in your warm water, your clothing, and shave in pieces of soap. You'd close the lid, and you would have to pump that handle back and forth to get the agitator on the inside to spin. But for each load, first you would sneak your outer to your lid. No, that was gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, upstairs here, we have most of the bedrooms. And since there were four people living in the house, they each had their own space. Alexander's sister-in-law, Carrie, slept in the room to my left. And again, she stayed here for five years after her husband died. During that time, she was also a foster parent, which is why there's a crib at the end of her bed. Now, one of the neighbors had lost his wife, actually, a few days after she gave birth to their son. And he couldn't take care of his child, the house, and do his job. So Carrie looked after the little boy for a year before the man we married. The room across the hallway is for Alexander, but he stayed up very late at night. So Eliza's room is on the left, and her husband slept across from her. Okay, that happens sometimes. Oh, it happens all the time, actually. Old house creature. Attention to is the case taped in front of me. Inside the case are some of the family's personal belongings. Uh, on the top left corner, on that small cushion, is a Scottish love cup. Now that would be used in a Scottish wedding ceremony, and most of the time it would have a crystal insert, so the The book just underneath that is a small book of poetry that Alexander's younger brother Ted carried with him. Uh, the silver medals were given to his father for his elocution lessons. The pin on that other cushion is for Alexander's tie. There's also the rules of capitalism. And it wasn't put out in the 1930s. Failed. Showed the joys of capitalism. <laughs> yeah, put out during the Great Depression. <laughs> All right, now, so we can head back downstairs. And the next room is the one to the left. It has a green couch. Probably to get old. Bumpy. 
careful, it's a little slopey here. Okay. My little clock, that wooden one, would be at home in this place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one that nobody can get going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we've made our way here into the drawing room of the house, which is more of a formal space for hosting, for celebrating holidays, and the room where Alexander and his wife had their engagement party in 1875. But the space used to be a bit smaller, because where the archway is above my head, there was a wall. The rest of that space would have been a bedroom for the hired boy, which would have been a boy hired uh, from England who had been an orphan, and he would have stayed here to help with the bells calling and general maintenance around the house. Uh, after they knocked down the wall, he would have had to live outside in the loft above the barn, but, you know, he would have been a lot more comfortable inside. Uh, but once they knocked that wall down, Eliza had more space to have tea with the guest at the back, and when she was using this room, she liked to sit in her favorite chair. Resting on top of her chair is her hearing trumpet, because by the time she was 13, Alexander's mother had lost most of her hearing because of an ear infection. The hearing trumpet amplified sounds and voices for her. It's very simple. The smaller end would rest inside your ear, and you would speak into this funnel shape to amplify the sound of your voice. Alexander didn't like using it. He thought it was a bit strange, so he would speak to his mother in a deeper voice with his lips close to her face so she could feel the sound vibrations as he was talking. Now, that was one of Alexander's first inspirations to study sound, but his mother wasn't the only person in his life with hearing loss. Alexander's wife Mabel, whose photo is just here, had lost her hearing at only five years old because of scarlet fever. By that age, she had already learned how to speak, but it was difficult to understand what she was saying because she couldn't hear the sound of her own voice. So Alexander was hired as her speech therapist. They met when Mabel was about 14, and two years later, Alexander realized that he was in love with her. So he couldn't tell her how he felt, which was very proper, so he went to her parents and asked for their permission if they could start to court. Unfortunately, Mabel's mother and father said no. He, uh, they wanted him to wait until she was 18 before they started courting. So Alexander waited for about three months. Mm -hmm. During that time, Mabel's sisters found out about how he felt, and he didn't want them to tell her. So Alexander confessed and told her that he loved her, but she also said no. She never thought about him that way and thought it was a bit awkward because he was her teacher and they had an age difference of 10 years. So when Mabel was 16, Alexander was 26. Now, they did stay friends and continue with her lessons, but over time, Mabel fell in love with him. They got engaged about two years later, uh, had their honeymoon in Niagara Falls, and that's where they had the photos on the mantle taken. Uh, Mabel and Alec were married to each other for almost 50 years, and they were both buried in Bedeck, Nova Scotia. How did they end up there? Yeah. Um, well, that's where they moved after they lived in Washington. Um, Alexander didn't like how busy the city was, and there, you know, they he wanted more space to do uh, experiments with planes and boats. So Bedeck was perfect because they found a little property that was basically its own little island, and he could do a lot more experiments there. All right, I'm not.
and they're they did their ties the end the, here. These lamps, mm -hmm. these little ones that they press on the table, do you remember you had those? Like an oil lamp, like that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those, yeah. yeah. Those are happy for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We have some in the gift shop. <laughs> Can we get a new one? Or I guess a new old one. <laughs> All right. Uh, now this last room here is Alexander's workshop and bedroom. Most of the work that he did in this space would have been the concepts and ideas for the telephone. When he was actually building his models, he was in Boston because that's where he was teaching for most of the year. When Alexander stayed in this space, it would not have been as clean and he would have been able to come and go as much as he wanted because there was a door where this window is. That was perfect because he liked going outside to study birds and to write in his journal. But Alexander also liked sitting at his dreaming place on the bank of the Grand River. At that dreaming place on July 26, 1874, Alexander had the idea for the telephone. A year later, while he was working in Boston, he built his first model. Now, to use this phone, you have to speak into the bottom. As you're speaking, your voice vibrates the leather drum. Pardon me, those vibrations travel through the strip of metal into the magnet, which does produce a small amount of electricity. Meaning your voice can be transmitted down copper wires attached at the top, and then connected to the receiving end where you listen for the other person. A year later, he built his liquid transmitter. Now this model worked a lot better because it had a stronger electric current thanks to the sulfuric acid that Alexander used instead of a magnet. So it was a lot less muffled than his first model, uh, but with the sulfuric acid and his liquid transmitter, Alexander made the first voice transmission in 1876 from one room to another in the same in the same building. Sorry, uh, that was in Boston. But about uh, a few months later, he also built a long distance telephone that could make calls from more than 10 kilometers away. It would have been used for his first long-distance call that Alexander made on August 10th of 1876 from downtown Brantford to downtown Paris, Ontario. Wow. For that call, he would have used the existing wires that were connected to the telegraph system. Uh, that meant he didn't have to go outside and put all the wires up by himself. But it also meant that he could know exactly how far away the distance was by just measuring from one telegraph office to the other. Uh, he also had friends who wanted to use his invention at the same time. So Alexander made one of these, so three of them could speak all at once. One on each side and in the middle. Uh, Alexander worked very quickly. Uh, within two years, he had the idea, built his first model, his second and third in the same year, and he did this while he was traveling between Canada and the U.S., while he was teaching, and while he was planning a wedding. He was very busy, but his creativity helped him develop and, you know, connect dots that other people hadn't before. He was thinking outside the box. Uh, so with his intelligence and creativity, Alexander invented the telephone about 149 years ago. Next year will be the 150th. These ones, yes. <laughs> Henderson House. Uh, the man that lived here was a 
good family friend of the Bells, and his name was Thomas Philip Henderson. Before he lived in Brantford, he actually lived in Paris, Ontario, and the Bells stayed with him for a week before they purchased their farmhouse. Now, Thomas Henderson was also a Baptist reverend who was originally from Scotland, and he moved to Canada 10 years before Alexander and his family. When he lived here in Brantford, this house used to be on 30 Sheridan Street, which is downtown, but they moved it here in the 1960s because Reverend Henderson's office, this room, was the first telephone business office in Canada. Hmm. From this space, you could rent two telephones in 1877, and they looked like this. Now, a lot of people ask if it's a camera or even a toaster, but on the inside of the wooden box is Alexander's third model, so it has the two magnets on the back, making this pretty heavy. Uh, you would have to rent two of these at once, because they were directly connected using wire. So it's basically a tin can phone. You have to have two, otherwise you can't make a call. Now, to actually use it, this opening is your microphone and your speaker. So to have a full conversation, you're moving your head back and forth the whole time. Now, eventually, you also had a listening piece that would be connected to the box using wires. And you'd hold this to your ear to listen to the person on the other side. The model that came afterwards, about a year later, was much smaller, and you only needed one. Now, the reason for that is because it was connected to a switchboard that would make a call to anyone else who owned a telephone. Instead of just being for listening, this handle here was also for speaking, so instead of moving your head back and forth, you just moved your arm. Now we actually do have three different switchboard models just down the hallway. Any questions before we go? I've had a few people say they knew someone or they themselves worked on a switchboard, which is pretty cool. And there's actually a lady that was here earlier this morning she was telling me that she worked on one very similar to the 1930s model. Hmm. Uh, it was a bit different, a bit more modern, but it's still an interesting story. Now we have three different models in this room, each from a different year and each very different sizes. This one being our largest and our oldest. But it has only seven telephones connected to it, and they all share a phone line. So instead of having private calls from one person to another, you can pick up your phone and hear your neighbor's conversation. So it's very similar to a party line. But about two years later, the switchboard got thinner, and it had 50 telephones connected to it. They're each represented by a tab and a number. Now, when the tab falls open, like it has here, you would find the number on the sockets and plug in a cable. You would also you would take the other cable in the pair and plug it into whichever number, let's say number 20, wants to connect to and number 31, you would plug in both of those cables so those people could have a conversation. Now that system is pretty much the same for another 50 years, but here into the 1930s, I can make connections with 90 telephones. Now being an operator was usually a job for a young woman who was unmarried, and you had to be unmarried because you were working long hours. So you would have to wear your earpiece here, and your microphone is hands-free. Instead of holding the receiver to my ear the whole time, it just connects and sits like this. So now both hands are free to flip switches and plug cables. But what's fun about this model, it's actually still working, and it's connected to the phone behind you on that purple gossip chair. Oh. Now the phone itself has no dial, buttons, or any numbers but it is connected to that black box on the wall, which has a handle on the side. If you crank the handle, it will signal tab number six here. Perfect. So now tab six has fallen open. What I would do, take a cable, and then I have to find the right switch based on what row. It's this one here. When it's pushed up, you should be able to hear me. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hi. Nice to, nice to chat with you. Yeah, <laughs> lovely to hear from you. <laughs> That's heavy. Yeah, it's all metal. 
Um, plastic wasn't really available until the 1950s, and then they started making those classic phones that everyone knows, like the, it almost looks like the Fisher Price toy. <laughs> Um, but after I was connected to you, I would ask who you wanted to be connected to. So I'd plug in that cable to that other number, and now I have to ring this person's phone. So with this same switch, I hold it towards myself and crank my own handle to make the phone ring. Where's the phone? That's actually in the next room. Oh. And they are connected if you wanted to talk to each other. Okay. Oh, look at us. Talk to me. There's a whole slew of it's been it's on the room, it's in the room to the right there, the wooden floor. Nice to hear you again. You're very distant. Okay. Well, I'll hang it up now. Bye-bye. Like a little older than you. <laughs> Yeah, but you guys are a lot older than me. <laughs> I don't know. So then you asked, um, did we have this one? Right? She asked me, she goes, Sue, did you have those phones? Yes. Mom, did you have those phones? Uh, my brother did. Mm -hmm. I go, I'm only a little bit older than you. <laughs> no, when my, when my, I've heard that from a lot of people. They say, oh, you had that one growing up, right? Uh, yeah, my yeah, son they, would say, oh, they were so on a farm. Mom, yeah, you were born in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> they were on a farm, and it was already there. The big, the big uh, Magneto one, the long distance one? It was a big one, yeah.